And welcome back. I'm Robert Breaker, Missionary of Avesis, the Spanish and English speaking people. And today we're continuing our series on the end times. On the end times. And today we're going to look at the rapture. And uh, last time we, we started the series and we looked at the time of apostasy. And that was what our study was last time. And I told you we're going to go in order in this series of the different things that are, that are taking place in the end times or the last days. Last time I showed how from about the 1500s to the 1800s, maybe even up to the 1900s, was the time of Reformation and how in the 17, 1800s there was revival all over and the gospel went worldwide. And then it was just in the last couple hundred years in which we fell into apostasy. And we looked at this last time, the apostasy that the Bible prophesied. And I told you how when the Bible talks about the last times or the last days, it's talking about starting with the very end of the church age, which is this, the church age, all the way out to the very end of the millennium. Those are the last times or the last days in the Bible. If you haven't seen it yet, you need to see my video on the 6,000 years, and actually 7,000 years of human history. Look that up on YouTube, 7,000 Years of Human History by Robert Breaker. Quite revealing, quite amazing Bible study. Well, we also looked at, last time, the seven churches. And I showed how these seven churches line up with the church age, and how we are in the last one, the last period, we are in the time of Laodicea. And I showed you what the Bible says about Laodicea, this final, evil, wicked, apostate church. In fact, he says everything they're doing, they're doing in my name without me, and they've literally kicked me out the door and slammed the door shut, and they won't even let me in. So it's like Jesus is saying, everything they do, they do in my name, but without me. They make all the decisions. They tell everybody what they want to do, and it's like they've forgotten me. And that's Laodicea. They do everything in God's name, but without God. So that's the apostasy that we're in in the last days. And so what we're going to do today, we're going to look at this time period here, or this event. We could call it the next big event on God's calendar, which is the rapture. And we're going to look at some things about the rapture, what the Bible has to say about the rapture. And I'm going to show you three different ideas of when the rapture is. I have people email me and call me all the time and say, well, I think the rapture is this, well, I think it's this, well, I think... And, well, I'm just going to show you what the Bible says, okay? You can think whatever you want, but I'm going to try to prove to you from the Scriptures that the rapture takes place at a certain time. And it's uh, three different times that people have when they think the rapture will take place. But before I look at that, I wanted to mention there are a lot of books in the Bible, and many of these books in the Old Testament are prophecies of things that will happen in the New Testament. Many of the stories in the Old Testament aren't just stories. They're actually foreshadowing events to come. For example, the book of Esther. Have you ever looked at the book of Esther? The book of Esther is an amazing book. Now, I'm not going to go there right now, but let me just explain quickly how the book of Esther corresponds with this time known as the rapture. In the book of Esther, there are two queens. There's a there's a Gentile bride named Vashti, and there's a Jewish woman named Esther. And if you read through the book of Esther, you find that this woman, Vashti, is a bad queen who disobeys her husband. Well, that almost sounds like Laodicea, the church that disobeys God. And in the book of Esther, what we see is Vashti, the bad one, the bad wife, being taken out. A type of Christ because the church is in such apostasy. And then in comes Esther. And God goes back to dealing with the Jews in the tribulation period. This is the tribulation. Well, that's what the tribulation is for, God going back to dealing with the Jews. So Esther saves her people, the Jews. So the book of Esther is an amazing book, and it kind of foreshadows and points to the fact that there will be a Gentile bride, the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, that needs to be taken out. And once it's taken out, then God goes back to dealing with Israel. And as we've looked at this before in some other videos, but we'll look at it more here next time, after the rapture, that's when God goes back to dealing with Israel. So it's just amazing. If you haven't seen my video, the books of the order of the books of the King James Bible. You need to look that up on YouTube. It's uh, Robert Breaker. Go to YouTube in the search engine and put 
order of the books of the King James Bible. And it shows you how we have in the Bible, the books of the Bible, in a pre-tribulation order. And it all lines up. That video will explain it so well. But I think that's interesting. I just wanted to throw that out there and mention it, that there is a, a Vashti, there is a Gentile bride, and the reason she's taken out is because she's so disobedient. And that's what God says of the church today. They are very disobedient. They're not following Him. They're not serving Him. They're doing whatever they want without serving Jesus Christ. And yet they claim to be His. Now, before we get started on the rapture, let me show you the three different ideas of the rapture. Uh, like I said, there are a lot of people that try, like to email and say, Well, you're wrong. There is no rapture. Well, those people don't know what they're talking about. There's other people that say, well, there's a rapture, but it's, it's way in the middle of the tribulation, or it's at the end of the tribulation. There's three different teachings of the rapture. There's the pre-tribulation rapture. Whoops. There's a mid-tribulation rapture, which, by the way, today they call the pre-wrath you ever hear anyone talking about a pre-wrath rapture? They're talking about a mid-tribulation rapture. And then there is a post-tribulation rapture. And these are the three theories of when the rapture should be. Well, according to the book of Esther, if you take it as prophecy, it shows that the first one is without a doubt. Because the whole tribulation is for God going back to saving the Jews and dealing with the Jews. Why would the Gentile even be there? So what we have here is we have three different ideas or theories of when the rapture will take place. Which one is right? Well, number one is right for many reasons, especially today. We see many people today trying to say, well, no, the number two is right. I have uh, two videos on YouTube. If you get a chance, go there and watch those videos. One of them is entitled, Matthew 24, Explained, Rightly Divided, Proving the Pre-Tribulation Rapture. The other one is called, Pre-Wrath Rapture? Question mark. And I go way more into detail about this, because many today are saying that number two is the right teaching. Now, we're going to look at why that's not, briefly. But those videos go more into detail of that. But many today are trying to say, well, number two is right. And so they say that this is when the rapture takes place. So the first theory, number one, is that the rapture takes place before the entire tribulation. Number two, the theory they say, is that it takes place in the middle of the tribulation. And then number three theory is the rapture takes place at the end of the tribulation. Now that's pretty dumb. Why would there need to be a rapture at the end of the tribulation? Well, if the rapture was at the end of the tribulation, why would there even be one? We would just all be there when Jesus comes back, because this arrow is Armageddon. So I don't understand these people that say, well, there's no tribulation, or no rapture, and if there is, it's at the end of the tribulation. Then that means a Christian can go through the tribulation, and that means a Christian can have the option of taking the mark of the beast. Why? That doesn't make much sense. Because we read in Revelation, those that take the mark of the beast go to hell. Can a Christian go to hell? No, because when we're saved, the Bible says we're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. So we won't even be in that time period when there will be the chance to take the mark of the beast. Now, the number one here, the pre-tribulation rapture, the rapture comes before the tribulation, has been the teaching believed by Christians for the longest time. Number two, this theory of a mid-tribulation rapture, which means Christians go halfway through the tribulation before the rapture takes place, is a new doctrine that is being taught and, and preached in many different places today. But to teach that, you must twist the scripture. And many people do. You can go and watch this uh, video someone made called uh, Marching to Zion, I think it's called, or uh, something like that. Um, there's another name as well, I can't remember, but they try to say that to say that there's a pre tribulation rapture is, is wrong. Really? Really? Okay, well let's go to 2 Thessalonians because I want to teach you right. I want to teach you what Christians have believed for the longest time, but not just what they believe, because Christians could be wrong, what the Bible teaches. Because does the Bible teach that we're going to go through the tribulation? Why? Why would we as Christians go through the tribulation when it's for Israel? You have the type of Esther and the bride getting out first. Why would we even be in a time in which God goes back to dealing with Jews? That doesn't make sense. So 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 1 through 4, we have what uh, I like to call 
a, a warning, a warning in which God warns us, the Apostle Paul warns us, don't let anybody deceive you. And it's my belief that this all ties in with the apostasy that in these last days people are trying to say that number one, this long-held belief of Christianity is not right, you have to believe number two, all ties in with the apostasy. They've fallen away because they've fallen away from the belief in number one and trying to deceive you into believing that you have to go halfway through the tribulation. So in first, uh, excuse me, 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 1, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto Him, that's what the rapture is, the gathering together unto Him, that you be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as the day of Christ is at hand. Now look at this warning in verse 3. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there be a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. So the falling away comes first. And Paul warns us, don't let any man deceive you. The falling away comes first, and then the rapture. And then it says, that man be revealed. Now what the Bible is teaching here is there is a man, and it calls him two different things. The man of sin and the son of perdition. This is the Antichrist. And what we'll look at next time is the tribulation period. And I will show you that this man, the reason he has two names is because he's a two-person man. He is the man of sin when he begins reigning, which is a physical man who's the Antichrist. But then he dies halfway through the tribulation, and I'll show you those verses. And he comes back as the son of perdition, literally Satan incarnate. And as Jesus died, was buried, and rose again, what we call the gospel, Satan will seek to imitate that death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And he will do the same thing as he tries to tell everybody, I am the real Christ. You know, some people will be deceived into thinking that he really is. So, the Bible says that when the falling away takes place, know the rapture is nigh. And as soon as that man of sin be revealed. Well, when is the man of sin revealed? Well, the man of sin rules three and a half years, and the son of perdition rules three and a half years. So the tribulation is a seven year period. And as soon as that Antichrist comes on the scene is revealed, that's when the rapture takes place. So there are some people today that say, well, I think he's that guy that's in the White House, and I think as soon as he becomes the head of the United Nations, and it's announced that he's the Secretary General of the United Nations, that's when the rapture will take place. Well, quite interesting, it's about time for him to be out of office, and he has expressed interest in becoming the head of the United Nations. So is it possible? <laughs> I don't know. But I do know that the Bible teaches that as soon as the Antichrist is revealed, the man of sin, that's when the rapture takes place. And it's after this time of apostasy. So don't be deceived. Don't let anyone deceive you into thinking, no, that's way out here, halfway through. A mid-tribulation rapture. No, the Bible talks about a pre-tribulation rapture. Now, those who say that the mid-tribulation rapture... Uh, let me start over. Those who say that there is a mid-tribulation rapture claim that Matthew 24 speaks of the rapture. Now, this is where they get so messed up. The Bible teaches that Jesus Christ, a Jew, came to who? Jesus said, I came, but I came only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So Jesus, a Jew, came to Jews. So in Matthew chapter 24, when Jesus is speaking, who does he speak to? Jews. I told you earlier, you can go to my video about Matthew 24 and the other one on pre-wrath rapture question mark, and I go way deep into that. But these people do not rightly divide the word of truth that try to teach the mid-tribulation rapture. And they go to Matthew, Matthew 24 and try to tell you that's the rapture, that's the rapture, that's the rapture. Now, I've got a question. How could Matthew chapter 24 be the rapture? When the Apostle Paul tells us, he's our Apostle, that God revealed to him a mystery that was kept secret. And that mystery is the rapture. Why would Jesus be speaking about the rapture in Matthew chapter 24? If it was a mystery that Paul tells us was not revealed until him. Either Paul's a liar, or those people that preach this are. 
Because Jesus tells us these will be the things that happen in the last times, in the last days. He's a Jew preaching to Jews about things that will happen to the Jews in the tribulation. But Jesus was not telling them about this time, the rapture, because the rapture is still part of the church age, which was still part of a mystery. You see, here in the early book of Acts, they had an option to accept their Messiah, and the kingdom could have started then. But because the nation as a whole rejected, remember the book of Acts is an Acts of, uh, a book of transition, because they rejected their Messiah, we have the Apostle Paul. Going more to Gentiles, yes, he did preach to Jews. And we have God revealing seven mysteries to Paul. If you get a chance, go to YouTube, look up the, the uh, teachings that I have, seven different videos, actually eight, because I have one introduction to the seven mysteries. And I preach and I teach about the seven mysteries. And there were seven different things that were revealed to Paul. Actually, one that was revealed to, the, to John as well. So we have this a mystery, and the Bible says that this, the rapture of the church, is a mystery that God revealed to Paul. So how could Jesus have been talking about the rapture here when it hadn't been revealed yet? Someone's not rightly dividing the word of truth. And so these people that preach the mid-tribulation rapture, or a rapture in the middle of the tribulation, or a pre-wrath rapture, that's where they're wrong. Because they assume that Jesus is speaking of the rapture. When clearly, according to the Word of God, he could not have been talking about a rapture because the rapture was not revealed until Paul way later. So you've got to get a hold of that. Now those who claim um, a post-tribulation rapture claim Jesus speaks of the rapture being here at Armageddon. And they go to John chapter 6 where Jesus is speaking. Let's look at that quickly. I don't want to go too into de detail, but I want you to see that there are three main ideas of when the rapture will take place. Which one is right? Well, this one jumps the gun and tries to force a mystery revealed to Paul back to Jesus, and that won't work. This one also won't work, number three. And I'll show you why. Um, here we go to uh, John chapter 6 and verse Mm, does it say 30 or 39? Sometimes I can't even read my own notes here. I think it's John 6, 39. Jesus is speaking. And this is the Father's will which hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. Uh, verse 40. And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Verse 44. No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me, draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. Now these people that claim that there is a post-tribulation rapture, that is that the rapture takes place at the end of the tribulation at Armageddon when Jesus comes back, that's when he raptures people, which makes no sense. Why would there even need to be a rapture? Um, these people claim that this is why, because Jesus said this. Well look at John chapter 11 verse 24. Martha saith unto him, I know that he shall rise again <clears throat> in the resurrection at the last day. So you see, Martha is talking, and Martha says, Jesus, I know that there's a resurrection in the last day. All of the Jews believed that. They believed in a resurrection, except the Sadducees, which uh, were Pharisee-type people that chose to not believe in a resurrection in the last day. But they all understood, they all believed that according to what God taught, that someday there would be a resurrection in the last day. Where does that fit in? Well, there's what's called the great throne of judgment, a great resurrection of all the dead at the end of the millennium, way, way, way out here. So was Jesus Christ speaking of that? And was Mary referring to that? Or was she referring to the rapture and what they say is the post-tribulation? Well, how could Mary and Jesus have been referring to the rapture if once again the rapture had not been revealed yet to Paul. So these two theories do not hold water. The theory of a mid-tribulation pre-wrath rapture and the theory of a post-tribulation rapture. The only theory that makes sense is a pre-tribulation rapture. Which means when the tribulation takes place, what kicks it off is the rapture of the church and all the saved people leave. And as soon as they leave, God goes back to dealing with Esther, dealing with Israel. Because Vashti, the church, 
has grown apostate and is not a good bride, so she needs to be taken out of the way, just like in the book of Revelation. We understand that the rapture was revealed to Paul. Jesus knew of an end-day resurrection, but Jesus wasn't talking about the rapture. Martha wasn't saying, yeah, Lord, we know that someday there'll be a rapture. <laughs> it doesn't make sense. So the only one that works is, number one, a pre-tribulation rapture. It was revealed to Paul only. So God used Paul and revealed some mysteries to Paul. And when we look at this, what we find is when Jesus came, he started with Jews. And he was here to set up this kingdom. But then they rejected him, the Jewish nation. And then it changed as the book of Acts changed. Well, just as it changed, this right here is almost a parenthetical period, this, this time period known as the time of grace. And what happens as soon as the rapture takes place, guess what it comes back to? Dealing with Jews again. So it kicks off right where it stopped over here. And everything that Jesus preached, everything that Jesus said, everything that was in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John starts again right here. But this period of the church age is a little different because this is the time in which God begins to deal with Gentiles and allows them the message of salvation, which is what? The gospel. The gospel is 1 Corinthians 15. I was wondering where I'd work this in. And verse 1 through 4, it is that Christ died for our sins, was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. That's how we're saved, and which, by the way, was something that God told Paul. So this is about the Gentiles here. So we have to understand, yes, there were some Jews that got saved in the church. I've gone into that in detail many times. In the church, the body of Christ, there are both Jews and Gentiles. But when Jesus came... He came for the Jews, and he wanted to set up his kingdom, but he offered it, and they rejected. Some people call that the postponement theory. You can call it whatever you want. It's what the Bible says happens, and you can't miss it if you read the book of Acts. So what takes place is the rapture comes first, pre-tribulation rapture, so that God can go back to dealing with the Jews. This is the only theory of the rapture that makes any sense, a pre-tribulation rapture. Also, in Job, uh, Job in uh, Jeremiah chapter 30 and verse 7. Jeremiah 37, you know what the Bible calls the tribulation? It's called the time, I'll have to write it up here I guess, the time of Jacob's, Jacob's, now who is Jacob? Israel trouble. Now if it is a time of Jacob's trouble, then who does that mean it's for? It's for Israel. Why would the church be in the tribulation at all if the tribulation is for the Jews? It's for God to trouble Israel so that they'll come back to him, to the very Messiah that they rejected Jesus Christ. So the rapture must be a pre-tribulation rapture. Now, with that stated, let's look at the two main passages in the Bible that speak about this rapture. And I've got a lot of things I want to cover today, and I hope this will be a blessing to you. I've had lots of people email me and, and contact me and say they've, they've met these other groups. One guy saying he's dealing with a guy that's a post-tribber right now. And this guy goes, oh, don't worry about it. We're all going through the tribulation, and when Jesus comes at Armageddon, that's when the rapture is. And he says, like, he wants to pull his hair out because this guy, how could he believe that? Why would there even be a rapture if it's waiting till the very end of this time to happen? When this whole time, the tribulation is for the Jews. So that's something he has to deal with. And it's, it, what it is, is not rightly dividing the word of truth. That's why the guy believes that. He's been taught false doctrine because he doesn't rightly divide the word of truth. I've had other people contact me and say, oh, we just get so fed up with these mid-tribbers. And they say, tell everyone, you're going halfway through the tribulation. You're going half Why? Why would you be in this time period when it's all about the Jew and God going back to the Jews in order to set up his kingdom when he comes back at Armageddon? 
So I have a lot of people say that they've been dealing with these people. So I'm hoping this video will help. Maybe you could give this video to those people to help them understand why the pre-tribulation rapture is the only one that works and fits all the types like the book of Esther in the Bible. And the rapture is a reason for happening. The reason is to get the church out, this old apostate church that's no longer a good faithful witness of Jesus, so that God can send some other witnesses the two witnesses and the 144,000 witnesses that are virgins. <laughs> you see, this one corrupted herself. But these are virgins, and God will always have a witness. Well, the witness is dying under the apostasy. I hope you can see that. I hope you understand. A pre-tribulation rapture is the only one that works according to scriptures. Now, two main passages which speak of the rapture are 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 13 through 18, and 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 55. So I'm going to read every word of these two passages. 1, Corinthians, excuse me, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 13. We'll begin there. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 we read, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren. Now, Paul says, I don't want you to be dumb. <laughs> well, if you understand and believe the pre-tribulation rapture, you're not going to be ignorant. These people want to be willfully ignorant to believe these two theories. This is the only one that makes sense and allows the mystery of the rapture. Because you can't take a mystery revealed to Paul and try to force it back to Matthew 24. It won't work. It won't work. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13, But I would not have you ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. He's talking about Christians who have died. That ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Now notice that. Them which sleep in Jesus will God bring with them. If you were alive during this period and you died and you're sitting here laying in the grave, what happens according to the Bible is when you die, your body goes to the grave. But your soul goes to heaven. So this is where your soul is if you're saved and you've died during the church age. Now when Jesus comes back, he will bring someone with him. What does it mean? How does he bring someone with him? He brings their soul back. And what the rapture is, is the resurrection of their body. So the Bible says, and Paul says it very clearly, absent from the body, present with the Lord. When you die in Christ during the church age, you're absent from the body. So your body is buried in the grave, but you're present with the Lord. How? Your soul goes to heaven. So it's a difference. Now there's some people that teach what they call soul sleep. That when you die, your soul lays in the grave and you're just stuck there. <laughs> and someday when the rapture takes place, it's like you open your eyes and you're... No, 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 no. Here's what he says. Paul says, 14... For we believe, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, them which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. The only way that God can bring someone with him when he comes down at the rapture is that their soul went to heaven, absent from the body, present with the Lord. So their soul is in heaven with Jesus. And their soul comes back with Jesus when Jesus comes back. Now when Jesus comes back at the rapture, he does not literally set his feet on the earth. He only comes in the clouds. And he comes with the souls of all the saints. And then their bodies come up, and they're changed, and they get a glorified body, which we'll read a little bit of more. So, you know, if you just read the Bible, you can't get confused, but I've met so many confused people. Many would say, well, I believe in soul sleep. When you die, you, your body and your soul just lay in the grave until the rapture. So who is Jesus bringing with him at the rapture? <laughs> He's got to bring the soul of the believer, because absent from the body, present of the Lord. The soul goes to heaven when you die, if you are saved. In verse 15, for this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. So, if we are alive in this world as believers, and the rapture takes place, we won't prevent them which are asleep. We won't leave their bodies down here. The Bible says this body is going to resurrect. And when it does, we too are going to be changed into a glorified body. Some people say, well, what about that verse that says it's appointed unto man once to die, and after this the judgment? Everybody has to die. Well, way over here there was a guy named Enoch, and the Bible says he never died. He says he was translated. He was taken to heaven without dying. You know what he was? 
He was a type of us at the rapture who are alive when Jesus comes. We go to heaven without dying. What an amazing thing. Can you imagine that? Never see death, never taste death. Well, it says here in verse uh, 15, For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. Now, he tells us about the rapture, verse 16, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the troy trump of God. Now, I'm going to talk about this a little bit here in a minute, but let me go ahead and write it up here. It says, three things are going to take place at the rapture, and then I'll get into this later. I have it written down in my notes, but this verse tells us, A shout, a voice, and a trump. A shout, a voice, and a trump. Okay? Just... Just put that on hold. Uh, we'll come back to this. But there are three things that take place when the rapture takes place. And what I want to do is I want to kind of give you a guided tour of the rapture, kind of a play-by-play, -play, what exactly will happen. Many people have emailed me saying, what will happen when the rapture takes place? Well, I want you to get it in your mind. Well, this has to take place. So you'll know that it is the rapture that is indeed taking place. So it says here, Verse 16, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. The dead in Christ shall rise first. Now what is dead? The body. So they rise first. Before we that are alive. One old preacher said one time, a little girl came up to him and said, Preacher, why did the dead in Christ rise first? Why don't we all rise at the same time? You know, kids come up with some good things, good, good ideas, just thinking. And the old preacher said, oh, God, give me an answer, give me an answer, give me an answer. And he thought for a second, he goes, oh, oh, I know. He said, God gave him an answer. He said, because they're buried six feet under. And they need to rise first so that they'll catch up and be ready to go up the same time we do. <laughs> I thought that was interesting. Yeah, that makes sense to me. You know, they rise first because if they're buried, most places believe in burying someone six feet under. So they, they need a little bit of a head start, don't they, since they're so far down. So that makes sense to me. The dead in Christ shall rise first. Verse 17. Then we, we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Verse 18. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. So it is a comfort to know that Jesus Christ is coming back and will take us home. And so that's the comfort. Now I'm going to show you some other verses a little bit later that tell us that it's also our blessed hope. It's a comfort and it's a hope knowing that we don't have to go through this time that was set aside for Israel, we get out before God goes back to dealing with the Jews. Now let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he gives us this a little bit more detail about the rapture. Now this is all you people that have emailed me and said, there's no such thing as the rapture. I don't know where you get that from. I'm showing you nothing but scripture after scripture after scripture. I hope you can see it. And uh, please don't contact me anymore and tell me I'm wrong, that there's no rapture. The Bible teaches that there is. It's a catching away. It's being caught up. And there's all these Old Testament types of it. Yes, there is a rapture. The word rapture, by the way, is not found in the Bible. That's a word that we have, have put onto the rapture. But just because that word isn't there doesn't mean it's not a doctrine in the Bible. It is. It's called the catching away in the Bible. And um, just like the word Trinity, the word Trinity is not in the Bible, but the doctrine is. God is one God with three parts, and he made man in his image, and guess what? We have three parts, a body, a soul, and a spirit. So let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse uh, 51 to 55. Now here we have Paul speaking, and he says, Behold, I show you a mystery. So here is the mystery that Paul is revealing of the rapture. Now, my Bible note says that this is written in about 59 A.D. <laughs> so, 59 A.D., God, Paul says, I'm revealing unto you the rapture. Well, here's Jesus before 33 A.D., because he died in 33 A.D., in Matthew 24. How could Jesus have been speaking about the rapture in Matthew 24? If it was, what, less than 30 years before the doctrine of the rapture was revealed to Paul? I don't understand how people try to preach a mid-tribulation rapture. The only way you can do it is to take away the fact that the rapture is a mystery and try to say that God revealed the mystery through Jesus. Then Paul's a liar. 
Because Paul says, I show you a mystery. And Paul says there were some mysteries that God revealed unto him. So obviously the rapture was a mystery that God waited to reveal to Paul. Now, <clears throat> verse 51, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, that is, our body shall not die, but we shall all be changed. So at the rapture, when the rapture takes place, there's a changing. This body is changed to a glorified body. That's the change that takes place. Matter of fact, it's being translated. Now, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 2. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. That's interesting, the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So, it's like Jesus, when he died and went down to the grave, his body resurrected. How did it resurrect? Immortal. So what was once mortal, decaying, being eaten of worms, God will change to a glorified, immortal body like the body of Christ, as we shall see. For this corruptible, verse 53, must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. 54, so when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. And on and on and on he begins to talk there. Um, a couple more verses, but I believe it ends there with, with verse 56. The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. Well, no, verse seven, uh, 57. But thanks be to God which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. What is the victory? Victory over death. Where does victory over death come? At the rapture. Because those who die in Christ, whose bodies are in the ground, will rise again. You say, well, what about people who have been cremated? Well, old Clarence Larkin had what he called the germ theory, in which God is so powerful, and I believe he is, that he knows where every molecule of every atom of every person that ever lived is. So if someone was cremated and their ashes were spread in the ocean, God could reunite all that back together and change it into a glorified body. I believe God can do that. If you don't believe your God is strong enough to do that, then help yourself. But my God is strong enough that He can do that. Amen? He can bring back together scattered pieces of a person's body. So, those are the two main passages that talk about the rapture. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 55, and 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. Those are verses on the rapture. Don't tell me there's no rapture. Those verses are talking about the rapture. Now, are there any more verses in the Bible about the rapture? In fact, there are. There are quite a few. Let's look at some of them. Let's go to Titus chapter 2. i got to move, man. Titus chapter 2 and verse 13. Paul calls the rapture the blessed hope of the Christian. We have a hope, and the hope is that we don't have to go through the time when the Antichrist reigns. We don't have to go through the time of Jacob's trouble. In Titus chapter 2 and verse 13 it says, Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. So, our Savior, Jesus Christ. We have a blessed hope. Let's look at uh, um, uh, Philippians 3.20. Philippians 3.20. Here in Philippians 3.20, it says, For our conversation is in heaven, from whence we also look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, amen. We're looking for His return at the rapture. Now look at verse 21. Who shall change our vile body, that it might be fashioned like unto His glorious body, according to the working whereby He is able, even to do all things unto Himself. So, here we have... Philippians chapter 3, verse 20 and 21, and it says the same thing that we just read in 1 Corinthians 15, that God will take this body and at the rapture give us a glorified, a glorious body, changed like the body of Christ that he had when he rose from the dead. Let's go to 1 Timothy 6. I just want to read you as many different verses. I'm sure I'll miss a bunch of them, but I looked up as many as I could uh, in Paul, in which Paul talks about the rapture. Uh, 1 Timothy 6, 14. Through 16. Verse 76, 14. That thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
15, which in times, which in his times he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord and Lord of lords. 16, and who only hath immortality dwelling in the light, which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. So Jesus Christ hath immortality. He is the light. Well, when we are changed with a glorified body, we too become immortal. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, excuse me, 1. 2 Timothy 2, 1 and verse 10. But is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. So it is through the gospel that we get immortality. Now we are saved when we trust the gospel, our soul is, but the rapture is when God makes our body saved. So salvation is, a, uh, is kind of a twofold thing. When you trust Christ, your soul is saved. It belongs to Him. It's sealed. The Bible says until the day of redemption. What is the day of redemption? The day in which your body is redeemed through the rapture and made into a glorified body. So it's amazing. It's amazing. There's so many things in the Bible if you just read it. 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 8. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but also unto them also that love his appearing. Now, I'd, man, I wanted to do this, but I don't have time. At the rapture, when we all go up into heaven, and this seven-year tribulation is taking place here on earth, we will be in heaven, and we will have what's called the judgment seat of Christ. And there you can get rewards and crowns from Jesus Christ. And then after that time, when the rewards and the crowns are handed out for the things that you did for Jesus, that's when Jesus comes back at Armageddon. And we come back with him. And hopefully we'll get to that in our later uh, series when we start talking about Armageddon. But uh, that's something you need to know, that there are some rewards in glory that you can receive. And it, and it comes from loving his appearing. It comes from loving Jesus and testifying and telling others about him. At that time, after the rapture, God will give you some rewards. Do you have any rewards in heaven? Have you done anything for Jesus Christ? It's a good question. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 1, But of the times and of the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you, for you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. And when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh among them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that the day should overtake you as a thief. And it goes on there talking about this time when Jesus comes. Therefore let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. They that sleep, sleep in the night. They that are drunk, drunken, are drunken in the night. But let us, who are of the day, be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love for a helmet and hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, these people that believe in a mid-tribulation rapture, what they do is they take the seven-year tribulation and they divide it in half, and they say halfway through we get raptured out. Because the last half, the last three and a half years, is when God's wrath is poured out on the earth. So they say, no, we have to go halfway through, and we get out in the mid-tribulation, we get out pre-wrath. Now how do we know that that's not what it's talking about when it says God has not appointed us to wrath? Let's go to Romans chapter, oh well no, let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 10. 1 Thessalonians 1 10 we read and to wait for his son from heaven, okay that's at the rapture, we're waiting for him to come who he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come <laughs> Jesus delivered us from the wrath to come Does, did Jesus die to, to deliver us from this, this wrath here? or Jesus died us to deliver us from the wrath to come. Wouldn't that wrath be hell? Hell is going to come upon the world. Uh, if we go to Romans chapter 5, look what we read here. See, people see a word and they try to use that word to prove their doctrine. Let's use the Bible to see if that word talks about that. Uh, Romans 5, 9, Much more than being now justified by His blood, we shall all be saved from wrath through Him. Does that mean we're going to be saved from this? You know how many Christians died already? that are not going to be saved from that because they're never going to even get close to that. They died way back here. 
No, the wrath is hell. So, Jesus died to save us from hell. But you see, they'll take these verses and they'll try to say, see, these verses prove that uh, the wrath is this wrath over here. Well, you can believe that if you want, but the only way you can teach that is to say that Jesus revealed the rapture, when according to the Bible, Paul revealed the rapture. And back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and he's talking there, verse 11, Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also you do. So it's a comfort. We saw in 1 Thessalonians 4, comfort one another with these words. So they say that the wrath is this wrath, and there's a mid-tribulation rapture. But you see, the only way that works is if Matthew 24 is written about the rapture. And it's not. So Paul talks about God delivering us from wrath, and not appointing us to wrath, but to salvation. So we don't have to go through the wrath of going to hell, because that's where God's wrath is cast out. Now there is a wrath cast, a wrath cast out here in this time period. But why would we go through the first three and a half years when we read in, in Thessalonians that the man of sin be revealed? Why didn't it say the son of perdition be revealed? Then I would teach a mid-tribulation rapture, but I can't because it says the man of sin be revealed, comma, the son of perdition. In God's eyes, that's the same man. But the reason there's two different ways that the Bible talks about him is because the man of sin reigns first, three and a half years, then the son of perdition, three and a half years. If he's revealed right out as soon as the apostasy takes place, and that's when the rapture is, then we must get out before the seven year, the entire seven year tribulation. Now, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. We're talking about verses on the rapture in the Bible. And I'm just trying to show you many places in which Paul talked about the coming of Jesus Christ. If you have a chance, if you haven't seen it yet, go to YouTube and look up my video entitled, The Two Comings of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ comes at the rapture, but he only comes in the clouds. We've already read that verse. Then he goes back up, and then he comes back down at Armageddon. So there's two times that Jesus comes. Now why would he go up and come back and only leave three and a half years? God always does things in the number seven. You can go look at my video on biblical numerics. It's always the number seven. You say, well, where do you get the seven years from? Well, way back over here in the book of Daniel. Daniel talks about Daniel's 70th week. And the week is a week of years. And there's one week missing, one seven-year period missing. So it's got to be this seven years out here. And guess what? That prophecy to Daniel was for his people, Israel. So that seven years, that missing week, must be for Israel. Why would we Christians even be in there? doesn't make sense. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 26. For as oft as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. So they're remembering the coming of Jesus Christ, which would be what? The rapture for the church. 1 Corinthians 13, 10. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. Now Paul is talking, and he's talking about charity never faileth, but whether it be prophecies, whether they shall fail, whether it be tongues, they shall cease, whether it be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, that which is in part shall be done away. Recently I did a sermon on are there apostles today? And I showed how the apostles were part of the early church. And what their ministry was, was to try to make the Jews believe. And then I showed how God ended the apostles, and that there's no apostles today. And so all the signs of the apostles ceased. But Paul says, then that which is perfect will come. Watch what he says here. Then that which is in part shall be done away. So God, in part, used the apostles and the signs of the apostles to deal with Jews. But when that which is perfect is come, why Jesus is the perfect one, when he comes at the rapture, that which is in part shall be done away. Guess what the Bible teaches? All these signs and wonders will come back here in the tribulation period as God goes back to dealing with the Jews. I mean, it's all there in the Bible if you just look. Acts chapter 1, we uh, read again of the rapture. I'm just trying to show you as many verses as I can in the Bible that talk about the rapture which once again was revealed to Paul about the church age because this is the end of the church age because once the rapture takes place then comes this 
and I've, I've mentioned it before, I hate to go too in detail when I have these other videos that I talk more about it, but God revealed unto Paul the gospel of 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4. In this time period of the tribulation, there is a different gospel being preached by an angel from heaven. Go to Revelation chapter 14 and you can look that up. Well, Paul said, though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we receive, let him be accursed. There's a time when there will be a preaching another angel in heaven. Paul said if that angel preached here in the church age, he's accursed. But if Paul's gone and the church is gone and the rapture takes place, and we're back over here to where Jews are using signs to, to try to reach Jews, then that angel's not accursed. So it all comes back to the rapture being the end of this parenthetical period known as the church age. And this is when it starts with the Jews. So why would we as Christians be in that period at all? Acts chapter 1, Jesus is out there with his disciples. And we read here in verse 9 through 11, And when they had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. So Jesus was taken up in a cloud. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. These men, of course, were two angels. Angels don't have wings. When they appear, they look like men. Which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. So here these two angels say, Jesus is going up here. He's going to come back like that. And they're telling how Jesus will return. He's coming back in the clouds. So there we have scripture and verses about Jesus coming back. Now, like I said, check out my video on the two comings of Christ, because at one coming, when Jesus comes, the Bible says he comes as a thief, and he comes only in the clouds, and he takes out, at the rapture, his bride. But then there's another passage, like Revelation 1-7, when Jesus comes, and it says, and every eye shall see him. Well, when Jesus comes at Armageddon, everyone will see him, but when he comes at the rapture, he'll be like a thief, and the world will say, wonder what happened. Can you imagine so many different people that were Christians all of a sudden just be gone? The whole world sitting there scratching their head. Where would all these people go? Well, if you're watching this video, um, this should explain it. And I'll get into that in a minute. Because when the rapture takes place, I used to think the world wouldn't even know. I used to think uh, ignorantly when the rapture takes place, the whole world will, will, will just scratch their heads and say, Well, I wonder what happened. And they'll never know. And uh, a lot of people say, well, they'll come along and say, well, aliens took them out. And, and, you know, that's a possibility. They'll try to explain it away through aliens. But I'm going to show you some scriptures that prove when the rapture does take place, the world will know it. Now, they won't see Jesus when he comes, but they will know, hey, something took place of biblical proportions, and it was probably what that old Sunday school teacher used to tell me. And I'll tell you that in a minute. But there are many different things here. What I want to do now is just uh, tell you how it's going to take place and what will happen at the rapture. Remember here, when I told you these three things and I'd come back to them, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 52, we read about this. And what we read was, In a moment and a twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. And we see here that a trumpet will blow. In another passage it talked about uh, a trumpet. When the rapture happens, okay, I don't know when it is, I can't tell you if it's today or tomorrow or a year from now or 20 years from now, I do know that it's got to be soon, probably within the next two years, because this is 2016 and 2018 will be 70 years since the nation of Israel was founded and Jesus said this generation shall not pass, so it makes me wonder, the, the rapture's got to be soon, very soon. But uh, when the rapture takes place, what we read in 1 Thessalonians as well was that there will be three things that take place. There's going to be a shout, there's going to be a voice, and there's going to be a trump. Now a trump is the sound that a trumpet makes. So a trump is a trumpet sound. Now I might be speculating a little bit, but I think I'm pretty dead on when I say this. That when the, the rapture takes place, and if you're a Christian... These things will happen in this order. The first thing you'll hear is, you'll hear a trumpet. And you'll kind of go, hmm. Then you'll hear a voice, which most likely will be your name. And then you'll hear a shout. 
and I believe that what's shouted is, come up hither. Now, I've got to move. I don't have time to look into each one of these, but I would ask you to look these verses up. Proverbs 25, 7, Revelation 4, 1, Revelation 11, 12. Each one of these passages, when, when, a voice, uh, when God shows up to someone and says something to them, He says, come up hither. So what is shouted, or the voice, is, uh, come up hither. So most likely, this is what it was taught to me, so this is what I believe, but as I read through the Bible, more and more I think this is probably it. What you'll probably hear when the rapture takes place, that day and hour of which no man knoweth the day or the hour, you will hear, Robert Breaker, come up hither. And those three things will take place. And that'll be it. Time to go up. Well, that'll be exciting, because God says he knows you by your name. Uh, in Acts 22, 7 and Acts 26, 14, Paul is explaining about on the road to Damascus and how God appeared to him. And guess what he said? He said, Paul, Paul. Many times in the Bible when God speaks to someone, he always says their name twice. Samuel, Samuel. You remember that? So sometimes I always wondered if God doesn't say your name twice. I don't know. It's possible. So just imagine. Do -do -do -do. Robert, Robert, come up hither. <laughs> That's what the rapture will be like. There will be the sound of a trumpet. Your name will most likely be uttered. And then you'll hear, come up hither. Now, uh, there are some types in the Bible of people that were raptured. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, we have a type of the rapture when Paul goes to heaven. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 through 4. And, well, actually, start in verse two, verse 2. I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth. Such a one caught up in the third heaven. So he's caught up. That's what the rapture is, being caught up. And he goes on to tell how he was caught up into paradise, type of the rapture. Now, I know what that's about. He was literally stoned, and he went up to heaven and saw it. But there's also the Apostle John. The Apostle John, in the book of Revelation, which, by the way, is another proof that the uh, rapture takes place before the tribulation. Because in Revelation chapter 2 and 3, it talks about the seven churches. Chapter 4 of Revelation, the verse, first verse says, After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And then everything else in the book of Revelation that's spoken about is the tribulation, Armageddon, and the millennium, and the new heaven and the new earth. Doesn't talk about the church again at all until way over here when she's the bride of Christ and she's New Jerusalem. So the book of Revelation is in order, so to speak. So chapter 4 is where the door in heaven is opened. So once again, why would a Christian go through the tribulation? All that's written about the tribulation in the, rapture, in the book of Revelation is after the door being opened in heaven, the type of the rapture. But in Revelation chapter 4, verse 1, after this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first verse, which, a voice which I heard was as it were a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee unto thee things which must be hereafter. So the voice says, Come up hither. The shout might be your name shouted twice, and then a trumpet sound. So this is what's going to take place. Now, there are so many different types in the Bible of the rapture. But that's what they are, they're types. And nobody knew these were types of the rapture until, once again, the rapture was revealed unto Paul. But now that we have that revelation, we look back and we say, wow, Enoch was a type of the, revela of, of, uh, of the rapture, someone that was raptured without dying. But in Matthew chapter 27, we find something that's quite interesting. And what I want to do now is look at what will take place when the rapture happens. What will be some evidences left behind that the world will see? What will literally take place at the very moment of the rapture? Mark chapter 27, this took place when Jesus died and, and rose again. And I said Mark, excuse me, Matthew 27. Matthew 27, verse 51. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. All right, this is when Jesus yielded up the ghost, verse 50. Verse 52, and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose, and came out of the graves after his resurrection, and went unto the holy city, and appeared unto many. Now this is only two verses in the Bible, but it tells us that when Jesus rose again from the dead, the graves of many bodies which slept arose 
and they appeared unto many in the holy city in Jerusalem. Now there's a famous preacher on YouTube, I won't mention his name, love him, good guy. Uh, I used to know his son real well and went to Bible school, same place this preacher went to Bible school. And he has an idea. It's quite an interesting idea. And I won't say that I believe it, but I'll also say that I don't. But it is interesting. You see, in 1 Thessalonians, we read at the last trump. And here we read of someone being resurrected, and when they did, they walked around in the city. Now, for how many days? For how many hours? How long? We don't know. But his idea was, well, it was probably for 40 days. So his idea was, the first trump blows... And then 40 days later, the last trump blows, and that's when we're raptured out. But during that time in between is when the bodies get up and walk around. Now, I don't know. But it's interesting to think about that, because what if it was three days? What if it was 40 minutes? What if the people that came out of the graves actually got up, walked around, appeared to many, and then the last trump blowed when it says, come up hither, so we all as Christians, get, get this in your mind, we all as Christians one day, we're working and we're doing something, we hear, doo -doo -doo -doo, and we're like, go call your mom. Mom, did you hear something? Yeah, I heard a trumpet for no reason. Well, that's interesting. And all of a sudden, you go open the door, and there's your dead grandmother, who was a Christian. Guess what? Jesus is coming. I mean, wouldn't that be interesting if there was, in between the trumps, the dead are the ones that rise first and appear to many? You say, that's ridiculous. Well, it happened in Jesus' day. When they rose again, they appeared to many. So could it be that that was a type of when this takes place, the reason it says the last trump is because there are several trumps, and that it will be the last trump when we who are alive are caught up, but at the first trump, the dead rise and walk around and appear to many. What a thing to think about. I don't know. Somebody told me there was a movie, a TV show that came out not too long ago called Resurrection. Guess what it was about? People who died coming back to life and appearing to people. <laughs> Weird. Weird. Is that trying to say that that might really happen in the future? I don't know, but picture this, all right? I never thought about this till another brother who, who called me and emailed me told me about it. It says, many graves of them which slept are, uh, were opened, and the bodies which slept arose. Do you know how many Christians have died in the last 200 years? 100 million, 200 million, 500 million, 1 billion? I don't know. That's a lot of people who have trusted the gospel, who were saved, and they're buried in cemeteries all over the world. You know what's interesting? Almost every cemetery, now some are a little different, but almost every cemetery, when they bury someone, they always make sure that person is facing east. Because we have a hymn that when Jesus comes, he's going to split the eastern sky. So many Christians over so many years would always say, when I raise again, I want to be looking in the face of Jesus when he comes back. You didn't know that, did you? Yeah, that's why they bury people facing east at cemeteries. Especially Christians, they want it done that way. Because they want to be facing in that direction. Now think about this for a minute. If Jesus blows that trumpet and the dead in Christ rise first... What's going to happen to all that dirt, six foot of dirt? Just going to explode straight up in the air. Imagine a cemetery that's 40, 50% Christian. And all at once, boop, 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 the trumpet blows out. Boom, all this dirt explodes in the air. It'll look like an atom bomb going off. You imagine you're sitting out there getting flowers or something, and then boom, and all this dust is going everywhere. It's scared the snot out of you. I mean, you talk about being scared, seeing all these graves just just for no reason explode upward and these people all of a sudden coming out in their glorified bodies and start walking around. You talk about a horror film. You talk about the night of the living dead. It would be scary if you're not a safe person. Now how long will they walk around? Will they walk around? Will that happen? It did over here when Jesus rose. Could it be that it does again here? Now some people say, well I think the rapture has to be in September. Because that's when the Feast of Trumpets is, which is quite interesting Interesting because it says the last trump. The Feast of Trumpets, they blow trumpets. So maybe it could be for just one day that they walk around. And when the last trump in Israel is blown on that Feast of Trumpets is when everyone else, I, I don't know. But that does seem to correspond, the last trump. And there's only one feast called the Feast of Trumpets in which they blow trumpets. So that, that's quite interesting. 
But that's not the most amazing thing. I mean, that would scare you to death if you were lost people to watch a whole bunch of dead people as their graves explode upward walking around. But you know what else will be very, very gross and very scary? We who are alive, the Bible says we are going to get changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. Go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So that means our mortal fleshly body will be changed in an instant to a glorified body. But guess will not be what will not be changed? Guess will, what will not be taken? First of all, our clothes. These are material, earthly clothes, so these will not be taken to heaven. So a pile of clothes will be left behind when we are raptured out of here. But that's not all. 1 Corinthians 15.50 says, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit in corruption. Now think about that for a second. Flesh and blood. You know what that means? That means there will be no blood changed when we go to heaven. When Jesus died on the cross, he shed every drop of this blood. Rose again in a resurrected body with no blood in it. The average body has probably five to six liters of blood. Go buy you about three, two liters of Coke in a store. And I want you to take that and just pour it on the floor. All three of those two liters. And see how much Coke just starts spreading out on your floor. And then think for a second, that's how much blood is going to be left behind of every Christian on the face of the earth. That much blood in a pile of clothes and jewelry. Can you imagine? You would freak out if you're a lost person. Sitting here at your job and you know, you're a lost person, you hate Christians, but there's three or four Christians that work at your job and they always try to tell you about Jesus. Oh, I don't like them. And you're doing your work at your job, you know, typing your computer or whatever. And all of a sudden you, you just hear a BOOM! And you think, uh-oh, terrorism. What just happened? And all of a sudden, ah, someone, this woman screams over on this side of the building. And ah, some woman screams over there. One guy cusses real loud. And what's going on? What's... And you run over, and there's this pile of blood just spreading everywhere. And there's these clothes left behind in the seat. And you say, well, that was, that was Rhonda. What about Nancy, the Christian? Same thing. What about Bob, the guy always going around talking about Jesus? Same thing, this pile of blood. Oh, oh my God, they were right. The Bible was true. And they're dead. No, they're not dead. They just got translated. They got a glorified body, had no need for that old sinful corrupt blood anymore. Didn't need those clothes because they got a, a robe of white. They just went to heaven and you got left behind. Boy, that would be sad, wouldn't it? Can you imagine? People would go literally crazy. Can you imagine sitting in a church and everybody in the church building, if it, you know, I don't like church buildings, but if you're sitting in a church building and everybody there is saved and you're not, and the preacher's preaching and the rapture takes place, and all of a sudden you're left behind and you look around, there's a pile of clothes and just blood up to your ankles. You would literally go insane. They'd come in and find you a couple hours later, and you'd be, you'd be a, you know, like a ball just sitting there going, ah, 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 and you would have PTSD for the rest of your life. Folks, the rapture is not going to be a picnic. It's going to be a worldwide global event where the earth literally explodes forth the bodies of those who were saved. It'll be like an atom bomb went off, and all this blood will be left behind with all these gar garments of those who were saved. Now, how do you explain that away? How does the world explain that away? Well, they might say, well, it's some new weapon that, you know, they used from other, or it's some, well, maybe aliens got rid of all the non -desire. I mean, they, they'll, they'll find a way, but it'll be hard to explain that away. How will we appear in our glorified bodies? If we're saved, what will it be like? Well, 1 John 3, 2 says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we, shall, we know that when we shall appear, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. So when that rapture takes place, we're going to get a body just like the glorified body of Jesus when He rose from the dead. What will that be like? I don't have time to go to the verses, but Luke 24, 36, It will be a body without blood. Luke 24, 31, it'll be a body that can change itself invisible like 
that. Kind of like this. And then snap, I'm back. Can you imagine a body like that where you can just snap your fingers and you're gone and snap your fingers and you're back? Turn invisible? It's a body that it can eat food. Jesus ate food. Imagine eating anything you want to eat and never get fat. It's a body that can travel faster than light. It's a body that can go through matter. John 20, 26. The Bible says they were in a place and the doors were closed and Jesus just appeared right in the middle of them. Just went right through the door, right through the matter. It would be an amazing, amazing thing. So this is what the Bible talks about when it talks about the rapture. This is the next big deal on God's calendar. And it's coming soon. Question, are you saved? Have you trusted Jesus as your Savior? Are you trusting the Gospel? Are you standing in the death, burial, and resurrection knowing that He died for your sins? Trusting what He did for you? If so, do you believe in the pre-tribulation rapture? Look, if you miss this one, don't expect to go in this one. There's not going to be one of these other two. It's only that one. Jesus is coming, and He's coming soon. And the reason He's coming is to take out His bride so that He can go back to dealing with Israel. If you're not saved and you don't want anything to do with Jesus, you better be scared. Because one day you will see these events of which I spoke. You will see the earth literally blow up as bodies come out of the grave. And you'll see tons of blood just all over with piles of clothes of all those who were saved. So today's the day. Why don't you get saved today? Why go on any longer lost when you can not only have a glorified body and a place in heaven, but, but God says you'll have a mansion of pure gold. You know, I don't see, I don't understand why anybody wouldn't want to get saved when salvation is so wonderful. Well, next time we're going to look at this time period of the tribulation. I'm going to try to go in order of the events that will take place in the tribulation. And uh, show you exactly what this, this whole thing is all for Israel. So I'll show you all about what takes place during that seven year tribulation. So I appreciate you watching. We'll see you next time in our series on the end times. And I hope this has been a blessing to you. I hope you, you get closer to Jesus. Tell more people about the gospel so more and more get saved because God knows those left behind what a terrifying time it will be. So thank you for watching. We'll see you next time on the Cloud Church.